started a couple weeks ago to talk about the will of God. Can we know the will of God? What is the will of God for our lives? And how can we discern these things? And so just by kind of a little bit of review before we jump into where we had left off, because it has been a couple weeks since then, um, maybe even a little longer than that, I don't know, because uh, I was sick for a little while and um, we just kind of haven't had Sunday school. So Ephesians 5.17 says, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So if, if Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus and telling them not to be foolish, but to understand what the will of the Lord is, that then implies that we as Christians can know what the will of God is in our lives and what, he is, what it is that he has uh, called or <clears throat> desires for us to, to know and to do. And so therefore, how do we know that? Well, we look in the scripture. We're not getting new revelations. Uh, we're not getting um, word from the Lord saying, oh, do this, as opposed to what is already stated in his word. That's why when a woman comes and says, oh, God has called me to be a pastor, to, to preach his word, uh, this is God's calling on my life. No, that's not the will of the, the Lord for your life because that goes against Scripture. God's not going to call you to do something apart from what he's already stated in his word. And so that's how we test things. That's how we can know and not be foolish and understand the, what, what is the will of the Lord. Even though if you were to say that to a woman these days, you would get lambasted. You would get told you're, you know, you're just a, a misogynist. You're, 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 you're hate women, you know, um, you need to be more of an egalitarian in, in this uh, feministic liberal mindset uh, that we live in today. But God's word doesn't change based upon the way society is going and the way culture is going. But we looked at that, we looked at God's will, we looked at his sovereign will. Um, we know that Ephesians 1.11 tells us, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined, predestined, predetermined, predestined, this is beforehand, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So God works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things, not some things, not part of things, not half of the thing, and then you work out the other half. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. When it comes to salvation, uh, the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 29, and 30, this golden chain of redemption we talked about, that for those whom he foreknew, and this foreknowing is not this, Pastor Buck and I was just talking about before church, uh, this God's not looking down the quarters of time and seeing what man's going to do and then saying, oh, I know now because I'm seeing it. That's not how God's foreknowledge is working. That's not what it means to be foreknown by God. To be foreknown is to be loved by God, to have this intimacy with God that he has with you of knowing you in this kind of way. It's as when Adam knew his wife, it was in this intimate kind of way. So this foreknowledge of God is this God loving before he even created you. A special kind of love for this individual. So he whom he foreknew, he also predestined. There's that word again. Can't get away from it. Predestined. And again, you, you look at the words and the way that the English has structured them and laid them out, the construct of a word, pre, meaning beforehand, destined. You can't get around it. It's just in the scripture. Predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So God's working all things together for the counsel, according to the counsel of his will. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Uh, God is sovereign over all of this. Nothing happens by chance. This is God's will. The Bible tells us in Acts 22, 23, and 20, uh, 22 and 23, that men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, 
Peter's saying on the day of Pentecost, he said, you know these things. You were here. You were around. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So you crucified him. You killed him by, by the hands of lawless men. But this was God's predetermined plan. So this was according to his definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. So God is working things out, using the hands of wicked men, bringing together all these things to, to come about to his plan, his purposes. But it was his will. It was his plan. It was his infinite plan that Christ would go to the cross, that Christ would die on the cross. So God's will of, of desire uh, is constant or consistent with his sovereign will. Okay, it's consistent with his sovereign will. So we looked at some of those as well. We looked at God's commanded will. Uh, that, so you have his sovereign will where we are seeing things that, or sometimes we don't see what his sovereign will is until later in our life. Why am I experiencing this suffering and it seems as God is never answering this? I don't know, but maybe later in life you start to realize this is what God was doing. Mm -hmm. But now God's commanded will is what he gives us in his scripture that is commanded for us to know this is God's will for me. So as we talked about with women being preachers. So once a woman says they're a preacher, no, God's commanded will is that you not be a preacher, not be a teacher. When someone says, well, you know, what is God's will in my life? To obey Him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, the uh, Bible says, do not be deceived. Neither adulterers, or fornicators, liars, thieves, homosexuals will inherit the kingdom of God. We know this is God's commanded will that we not do these things. It tells us to walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. These are commanded wills of God that is given to us that we can know what God's will is in our life. We looked at some passages of Scripture as well. We looked at the differences, again, between the sovereign will and commanded will, and, and uh, um, just to kind of recognize and understand those. And so now we are into this section of looking at our response to God's will, our response to it. So when we think about what our response to God's will should be, um, we, we, we have to recognize that we have to trust or that we have to trust in the truth of God's word in all of our situations regardless of what they may be. And so when we look at Psalm 5 or Psalm 11:5 the Lord tests the righteous, right? And we have to rightly recognize and understand that when God is testing us it's not for his benefit okay it's not that god tests us so that he can understand i wonder what they're going to do if i put them in this situation god knows the test is for you the test is for your growth the test is for you to become more mature in the faith the test is for you and so the lord tests the righteous psalm 11 5 says the lord tests the righteous but his soul hates the wicked and the ones who loves violence. So he tests the righteous. We think of when he calls Abraham to take his son, his one and only son, Isaac. Now was Isaac his only son? Was Isaac the firstborn of Abraham? No, he had Ishmael, right? But in this understanding of things, we even see it in, laid out for us in Romans 9, that this one son is this one of the promise that was promised to him. And then we also see that type, that uniqueness of him, of, of, of Isaac being a type of the Christ that is to come. Just a type to an anti-type of Christ. And, and so he tells him, take your son and I want you to sacrifice your son. And so Abraham is tested. But it's not because God doesn't know, even though, again, language, uh, we kind of talked about anthropomorphisms, or we mentioned anthropomorphisms on Thursday night. But the Bible gives us anthropomorphic language, which means it relates God to us in such a physical way that we see things and say, okay, but, but God doesn't really have 
God's not really a duck, or he doesn't have feathers, right? Even though the scripture mentions that. It's anthropomorphic. And then the other language that's used, the big word, anthropopathic, okay? It's dealing with emotions, it's dealing with feelings, and it's dealing with God explaining something to us in such a way that we can relate and understand, but we also have to make sure we don't then try to put God on man's level. So when he says to Abraham, sacrifice your son, and Abraham goes up there and he's going to sacrifice Isaac, and then the angel of the Lord says, stop, do not harm him, for now I know that you trust the Lord or believe the Lord. Right? It's not, so again, he's relating to us in such a way, but again, it's not that God didn't know what Abraham was going to do. Okay, So th these are things we have to try to wrestle with at times because we're trying to understand Scripture rightly, but when we see it as a whole in the big picture, we understand that God's will is God's will. It will come to pass. God is not um, taken off guard by any decision man makes. He knows the decisions that man will make. He's decreed for all things to come to pass. And so when he tests us, he's not testing us because he doesn't know the outcome. He's testing us because it's part of his plan to build within us, to mold within us into the likeness of his son, Christ Jesus, to build us in our righteousness, to grow us in our sanctification. We don't always do that perfectly. We fail often. But this is what God is working in us and through us um, when he's testing us in this way. So testing also, again, it, re it reveals the true heart. Again, not to God, but to that individual. To that individual who's being tested by God. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know, that was, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And again, I, I want to make sure this is emphasized and clear, not because he needed to know, so that he might humble you, so that you may know what is in your heart. Right? It says, uh, or, or, and we should not be surprised uh, when we are tested, 1 Peter 4, 12 tells us, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised at these testings, at these trials that come in your life. And so we are to trust the Lord even when we don't understand or see any end to what is in sight. So our response to God's command, His commanded will, is that we need to know and obey God's command will. So how do we know what God's commanded will is that we are then to obey? Well, Ephesians 5.17 says, Therefore, again, as I read in the beginning, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand it. How do we understand it? We have to get into God's Word. We have to read God's Word. We have to take time in God's Word to understand. We have to spend time in God's Word, but not just spending time in God's Word, but in prayer and seeking the Lord to change us and transform us and to bring us into conformity with His Word. Right? Uh, Deuteronomy 11.1 1 says, You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. So Deuteronomy doesn't change because it's Old Testament. He's telling these Israelites in this book of law, this Deuteronomy, that he's telling them uh, that you are to keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. Deuteronomy 29.29 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us. So the secret things we may not fully understand. There may be some mysteries we don't fully comprehend. But that which has been revealed to us, it belongs to us and to our children forever. That we may do, that we may do all the words of his law. Of his law. And I think because of dispensationalism over the years when it became popular and, and brought into the churches, and there was this contrast between law and the Old Testament law and what is our, our obligation under grace, and they put this dichotomy there that doesn't need to be there. No, nobody's saved by law. Nobody ever was saved by law, but there's not a dichotomy. God's law is good. God's law is just. God's law is righteous. 
And so when you, you look at even David, when he says, I love your law, I meditate upon it day and night. God's law is good. And so we are to uh, do all the words of his law. And, and so we are to, to look at his law. And in, in, the, in the confession of, uh, I'm a 1689 guy, Reformed Baptist guy, but even when you look in the Westminster, which is more of a Presbyterian kind of confession, uh, 1689, go back 1646 for the First London Baptist Confession, 1644 for the Westminster, and they're writing this confession out saying, this is what we believe. This is what we believe. And as they're writing this thing out, they talk about the general equity of the law. And so let me explain that a little bit. Is, is when we look in the Old Testament law, there are laws that were given to the nation of Israel that we don't, we don't practice some of those laws today. Ceremonial laws, those are done away with. Those are in Christ. But there is a practical law, moral law, which is never done away with, and then a judicial kind of laws that we can look at things, and they talk about this general equity. We take the equity of that law, and how does that apply to us today? For example, for example, the Israelites were to put a, uh, a fence or a guard around the roofs of their house because in their culture they would go up to their roofs and this is where they would go and spend a little bit of leisure time. And to make sure that your guests, your neighbors, don't fall off the roof and die, you put a railing around it to, to prevent your neighbor, to love your neighbors so they don't die. Well, we don't typically go on our roofs these days, unless you have something built that way, right? We don't we don't just go and hang out on the roof. I mean, maybe you see some movies where the kids close out their window and they're sitting on the roof, just chilling or hanging out. But but we don't we don't typically do that to go out on our roofs. But what are some of the things that we we do to protect our neighbors? If you have a well in your yard that somebody could fall in and get hurt, you maybe put something around so that people notice that there's a well there. Or a swimming pool. We, we put a swimming pool in an infenced area so your neighbor doesn't come over and fall in your pool or a little kid and drown. We do these things to protect them. So we look at the general equity. What is, how does this principle, how can this principle apply to us today? So that's how we, we look at this and this confessions lay this out as to understand how we view some of the judicial or, or uh, uh, practical laws in the Old, Old Testament. So I say that because, again, his law is good. The words of his law. And that can also mean in referring to the words of his law being his, his scripture. And when, when, when you think of the first five books of the Bible that known as the Torah, it's known as the law. So it can also mean as a whole, God's word. All right. So we are to be obedient to all that God has revealed to us in his word. It's important for us uh, to, to remember that, to, to, to keep that in our minds. So, when we think about God's will again, guidelines to discerning God's will in everyday decisions. How do we then go about discerning God's will in our everyday decisions? And so a valid question is, how can I know God's will in the choice of a career or who I should marry? The answer to this question is to be faithful to God's will as revealed in the Bible. And then follow the guidance of Psalm 37 4 which says delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart so in trying to discern God's will we delight ourselves in the Lord and he will give us the desires of our heart too often we attempt to try to delight ourselves in other things in other people rather than in the Lord and so those other people won't give us the desires of our heart those other people won't meet and fulfill those needs that we think we have or that we may have but we delight ourselves in the Lord and we seek then his guidance and we seek to discern these things in our lives. So delighting ourselves in the Lord includes loving him with the, our heart, with a heart of obedience. This leads to this question, what are key areas that are clearly revealed, revealed in Scripture as God's will? And so we go to what is clearly revealed in Scripture to be God's will that we know. These are the following uh, these following uh, scriptures we can look at. We know it's God's will for us to be saved. It's God's will for us to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth? So, you have to rightly understand that. What does it mean to be all people? You've got to look at the context. In that context, he's saying pray for all people in authority, kings and, and low people. Pray for all. 
these people. And then he says it's God's desire that all be saved, and it's in the context of all types of people. But we know that it is God's will that all types of people to be saved. And so, as a believer, as one who is then seeking for God, why would we be seeking for God? Because he first sought us. We love him because he first loved us. So, in that, we know to be saved. As a believer, we know that it's God's will for us to be saved. To be filled with the Spirit. To be Spirit-filled. Ephesians 5.18, it says, do, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. How is one filled with the Spirit? That's the question that then arises. How is one filled with the Spirit? It's not by going to some quote-unquote planned revival and having this evangelist or person that's preaching that preaches the same message, this town, that town, this town, and this town, that gets up there and shouts and screams and gets you fired up, that's not being filled with the Spirit. Having the charismata, the charismatic kind of gifts, is not what it means to be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit is to be entrenched in God's Word. Entrenched in His Word. And so the Word of God dwells richly within you. And so therefore then being filled with the Spirit is then acting out upon what God has already put in you through His Word. Being filled on the Spirit. Being, being in prayer, seeking God to guide you in all that you do and say. Uh, this is also a sign of being in God's, being filled with the Spirit because, again, you're taking the Word, you're applying it, and you're seeking God to lead you. To be submissive to authorities. We know this is God's will. His commanded will. 1 Peter 2, 13-15 says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Put to silence that ignorance of foolish people. What also is God's commanded will that we know? from the scriptures and we can see and testify to that we are to be willing to suffer for his sake. We're to be willing to suffer for his sake. People don't like that. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to have to experience that. But we are to be willing to suffer for his sake. 1 Peter 3, 17 and 18 says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So we are to be willing to suffer for his sake. We are called and commanded to be sanctified. To be sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality. And it gets into a list of these uh, ungodly practices here. But you are to be sanctified. This is God's will. This is God's will. And what is sanctification? People often mix justification and sanctification together. And while when one is justified, they are made right before God. They are now in right standing with God. And that happens one time. When you come, when, when the regeneration happens, when one is born again, which is something people often also don't understand rightly. They think being born again means being saved, but it's, it's dealing with regeneration, which is a part of salvation. It happens simultaneously. But it is being saved, being regenerated, being born again. And then this justification takes place. You believe, and when you believe, you are justified. You can't be unjustified before God if you've been justified by God. You can't lose that justification. Man is justified by faith and faith alone. But then sanctification is this process. So you're justified and you receive sanctification at that time, but your sanctification is this ongoing process of continuing to grow in the Lord. The more you're in His Word, the more you grow towards God in your sanctification. 
the more you are um, obedient to his word, the more you experience these fiery trials and testings in your life and have overcome, the more you grow in your sanctification. So Christians are not without sin. Christians are not without failings. But a Christian should be able to say, I'm more sanctified today than I was 10 years ago. Not perfection. We still have areas where we all need to grow and the grace of God to be gracious, gracious and merciful to us. But our sanctification should be a process where we have gone further than where we were 10, 5 years ago. So being sanctified. Uh, we are to be self-sacrificing. Self-sacrificing. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and what is acceptable and perfect. So again, very important passage. Um, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I think, as I was growing in my, my Christianity, the very first message that I, I ever really came across, I mean, I heard other messages, but what I came across was, I'm, I'm listening to Moody, and, and there was this guy, Chip Ingram, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Chip Ingram on Moody, and, and he was talking about, uh, uh, what was it, uh, be a Romans 12 Christian. R12 or something like that. It was a series and I came across it. And so that always stuck to me. Um, and then I've kind of grew and, and come to more reformed preachers, so I don't really listen to him anymore. But the, 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 the point is, this stuck with me. Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Be self-sacrificing, which is holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It's your spiritual worship. It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How are we then transformed? What does repentance mean? Repentance is a change of mind. The Greek word is metanoia. It is to change your mind. And so how do we change our mind? Well, first and foremost, God changes our mind. Okay? If God doesn't change your mind, you're not going to repent. But if, if one has come to repentance, we still have then this responsibility when it says, don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, how do we continue in the sanctification process to renew our mind? How do we do that? Because that's important. So how, how, how do we do that? Well, what, what, are, what are we putting into our minds? What are we feeding our very souls? Is it the word of God? Are we, are we feasting upon God's word? Are we taking in his word and those things which edify and encourage and build us up in the Lord? Or are we taking in the garbage that's out in the world? Are we taking in the worldly wisdom when Mr. Worldly Wise comes by and says, ah, do these things. It's a reference to Pilgrim's Progress if you haven't read that book. I think I might still have one up here. But are we, are we putting in our minds the things that build us up in Christ? Are we listening to the things in the world that devalue women and speak highly of sin and, and all the things that God hates? Are we taking that in even in, and I'm not a legalist, so don't go here, but are we taking in movies and certain things that depict us in such a way or depict the character of people in such a way that it, it blasphemes God or it, it devalues the character of God or the commands of God? Or are we building our minds and, and renewing our minds by the things that edify and build us up. What's that saying? You are what you eat. You know, so you, you do take in these things and they affect you. They affect you. And so God's telling us in his word that it is his will that we not be conformed to this world, but that we be transformed by the renewal of our minds. So when we think about this, what is that which God instructs us then to do? As we look into his word, he instructs us to obey. We obey. Psalm 25, 8 and 10 says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, 
He instructs sinners in this way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast, love, and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. So again, when we understand God's language of covenant keeping, which Israel did not do, they were covenant breakers, which is why God judged them in 70 AD. Um, but we, we see God in this psalm writing through the pen, the inspiration of man, most likely, I think it's David, 25th Psalm. Could be wrong, but I think so. Uh, but he's telling us that he leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. So John MacArthur says in the quote here, to be filled with the Spirit is to live in the consciousness of the personal presence of the Lord Jesus Christ as if we were standing next to him and to let his mind dominate our life. It is to fill ourselves with God's word so that his thoughts will be our thoughts and his standards our standards and his work our work and his will our will. Christ consciousness leads us to Christ likeness and don't get this Christ consciousness twisted with the new age wording that they use in that. That's not what MacArthur's saying here. But it is to be Christ-like. And I really like the way that he, he lays this out here, that his mind dominates our life. How does Christ's mind dominate our, our lives? Again, we go back to the Word. If you're not in the Word of God on a regular basis, consistently, and, I, and I'm, we all fall short. I'm, I'm not saying this is as something where, you know, every day I spend 20 hours reading God's Word, Okay. I'm not saying it as that, but if we are not in his word, how is his word, the mind of Christ, going to dominate our lives? Because those who are in Christ have the mind of Christ. The Bible tells us that. But how is it going to dominate our lives if we're so taken by everything else in the world, but not God's word? Not the mind of, of God's word through as he has revealed it to us. But it will dominate our lives it is to fill ourselves with God's word so that his thoughts are our thoughts. Think about that. Is God's thoughts your thoughts? Is your mind dominated by his word? Is his standards your standards? Or do we look at the world and all the things that they say out there in the world is acceptable and, and right, calling that which is evil good and that which is good evil? Or are our standards his standards, which don't change? which are set already in his word. It doesn't change it. It's there. And his work, our work. His will, our will. Do we want to operate according to our will, apart from his will? No, we, we pray. We seek the Lord, and he will give us the desires of our heart. You know how he gives us the desires of our heart? He changes our heart and changes our desires to be conformed to his heart, his desires. Okay? So when we look at this and we think about the guidance that God then gives us, uh, because of his great love, God has predestined, predetermined beforehand, called, justified, and will glorify all believers. And so he also then guides us in this practice or in this walking out of our faith. So this meaning of guidance, God, the guidance is God's active role in our lives, accomplishing his purpose. He leads to shepherd and to bear or to bear or carry. That's what it means to, to lead as he's a shepherd, right? Psalm 78, 52 says, Then he led out his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Psalm 139, 24 says, And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Right? He guides, which means to show, to help, to understand. Psalm 23, 3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Psalm 73, 24 says, You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. So God guides. He leads. He directs. Which means to establish or to prepare. To make straight. To make straight. All right? 
Proverbs 16, 9 says, The heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. Establishes his steps. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5 says, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. He directs. And so, when we consider these things and we think about these things as God guiding us, leading us, guiding, directing our paths, right? How do we know these things when we are not in God's Word, when we are not being filled with the Spirit of God? Because we're so distracted by the things of the world. Those things have a higher priority than the things of God. Right? So, when you think about these things, we have what is uh, these indirect ways in which God guides us? He guides us through His Word. So we've talked about the emphasis on God's Word, how important it is. He guides us through conscience and conviction. Conscience means with knowledge. Con with uh, science knowledge. So with knowledge, we are with knowledge. We are... We are all given a conscience to know right and wrong, and he guides us by that conscience. And, and conviction, for those that are in Christ, as you're doing something and you're convicted by the way you're, you're doing something or responding to something, there's conviction. This is a way in which God guides us. Providence, which means circumstances that are controlled by God. He allows us to go through certain circumstances and, and through those circumstances he may close a door that we can't walk down anymore and he is guiding us in that way. It's his providence. Or he may open a door to something that we didn't expect to happen. This is his providence in our life to guide us into what is his will. And wisdom and counsel. Wisdom and counsel. Again, God does use others in our lives to provide wisdom, to provide counsel. That's why it's so vitally important that people are members of a local church. Not just attenders, members committed to a, a body, faithful to, to, to that body that God has called them to be a part of. So that then they can seek out wisdom and guidance and counsel from others within that body who care for them. Who aren't just going to give them false sense of hope and false things that are, are not true because they're concerned whether or not they're going to leave. They're going to tell them the truth. Because they care for the, that individual. These are ways in which God guides. So again, as we close it up, guidance through God's word, through conviction, through God's providence, and God-given wisdom. This is how we discern and know the will of God in our lives.